as I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Daniel McInnes is bringing the sermon to us this morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I mean. Today's gospel is always stuck in my mind from, even from my um, early years because I've always heard it preached in a very particular way in the churches that I went to, and that maybe was just because I was from a Pentecostal background, but it's always stuck in my mind. There's always been the idea that in the story of the Canaanite woman, Jesus is kind of reluctant to heal the Canaanite woman's daughter um, and has to be kind of begged to do so. And so there's been a lot of time in sermons I've heard um, spent trying to explain why that might have been. Um, after all, Jesus healed and interacted with plenty of other Gentiles with no such hesitation. Recall that Jesus healed the centurion's servant, spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well, um, healed the ten lepers, one of whom was a Samaritan, and the Samaritan actually came back and, and thanked him. I'm not sure about you, but it seems to me that it's unlikely that Jesus was actually reluctant to drive this demon out of the woman's daughter. So what's going on in the story then? To see that, we need to look at the wider context, and by that I don't mean the, the cultural context, although that's important, but the context of the narrative that Matthew has actually given to us, the scriptural narrative. Just prior to this, Jesus has given a very harsh rebuke to some scribes and Pharisees who have come up to Jeru from Jerusalem to see him. They were complaining that Jesus' disciples didn't wash their hands before eating bread. In reply, Jesus called them hypocrites and asked them why they perverted the intent of the law by making traditions that would nullify the need to keep it. Quoting Isaiah, he said, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips. But their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as commandments the doctrines of men. To the multitude, he then explained that it is not what goes into the mouth that makes a person unclean, but rather what comes out of their mouth. However, the disciples, true to form, the disciples are well known for not being the quickest to understand what Jesus says, um, and we should put ourselves in their place, didn't really understand, and they were more worried that the by the fact that Jesus had upset the Pharisees um, than anything else. At which point Jesus had to point out to them and explain to them that when food is eaten, you eat it and it's eliminated. But the words that come out of our mouth come from our hearts, which is where evil thoughts, murder and so on proceed from. And it is these things that defile us. And it is directly after this that Jesus takes them into the Gentile region of Tyre and Sidon. Why is that? Because even though he's explained this to them, they still don't really understand it. They don't understand the implications of what he's said. And Jesus is going to give them a real-life lesson to make it clear. Just as, a, as an example in my own life, um, I remember once on a military exercise, we were out in the field and the um, the directing staff in charge was a warrant officer from the SAS uh, regiment in Perth. He was a, so he's one of those tactical kind of gurus. So we all looked up to him and listened to him very carefully. And I was the section commander on that day. And uh, at, in the evening, you have to, you have to set sentries to, to guard the place where you are, you're camping. Um, so in the evening, you set the sentry. And at night time, you, you bring the sentries kind of back in closer. And he told me, he explained to me, this very particular way that they would do it kind of in the SAS. And I thought I understood what he meant. So um, as it turned out, I didn't understand what he meant at all. And we ended up with some, we, we had things called claim wall mines and we ended up with two of them with the wires all tangled up. And it was a real mess and a disaster. It took quite a, quite a bit of time to fix in the morning. Um, so th the point was that unless you actually do something, unless you actually experience it, you don't quite, often don't quite understand what's happening. And that's what happened to me. I didn't really understand what he meant until it turned into a mess. And then I understood what was supposed to happen after that. And this is what Jesus is about to do with his disciples. So he's taken them up to the rear of the, to the area of Tyre and Sidon. Okay, the region of Tyre and Sidon was settled in ancient times. It's got a very ancient history. And it was the center of the Phoenician Empire which was rich from the production of glass, which they exported all over the place, purple dye, which was used, very expensive purple dye, um, used for royal robes and so on, that kind of thing, and trade. They worshipped the god Baal, along with many other gods, and their worship practices sometimes included the burning of children as sacrifices. 
It was not uncommon in that region in that, in that time. But by the time of Christ, Alexander the Great had besieged and destroyed Tyre, um, and the Romans had subsequently come to power. It was largely a Hellenised region, so it's very Greek in character, uh, with the worship of pagan gods being part of just everyday life there. So when Matthew describes this woman as a Canaanite, he's telling us that she's one of those people, just about as far from the Jewish idea of being clean as you could possibly get. So it's extremely interesting that she cries out to him, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Something you would not expect to come from the mouth of a Canaanite woman from the region of Tyre and Sidon. These words should remind you of similar words. Um, the last time I preached, it was about the blind man outside Jericho, and he said very similar things. You know, have mercy on me, O son of David. So these same words are coming from her mouth. And they reveal that she, just as the blind man outside Jericho, just as, just as he understood that Jesus was the Messiah and that he believed that Jesus had the power to heal him, even so, this Canaanite woman, so unexpectedly, is showing that she believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David, she knows his messianic title, and she believes that he can heal her daughter. So, but then the strange thing happens. He doesn't answer her. Why not? Why doesn't he answer? And this was the, what I was referring to earlier in sermons past that seemed, you know, people preached that um, it seemed to be re Jesus reluctant to, to heal her. Um, but really what he's doing is he's waiting for the response of the disciples. Have they learned something? Have they learned anything from the whole deal with the Pharisees and, you know, cleanness coming from the heart and uncleanness coming from the heart, not from the external things, from food and so on? Have they learned anything? So he's waiting for their response. And they ask Jesus to send her away. They beg Jesus to send her away. She's a nuisance, not worthy of his time or theirs, an unclean Gentile. Moreover, he then answers the woman in the way that the disciples would expect. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of Israel, the house of Israel. When she cries out again and bows down to him, he says, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Notice that she doesn't really disagree with Jesus at all. She's a, she humbly takes what he says as being truth, but she doesn't give up either. And she answers, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Finally, Jesus praises her saying, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. Like the blind man outside Jericho, she will not be put off. She knows that Jesus is the Messiah and has faith that he will heal her daughter, or he can heal her daughter. In fact, like the blind man, she seems to understand who Jesus is better than the disciples do. It seems clear to me that Jesus is not reluctant to heal her daughter at all, but rather is using her right confession from the mouth of this woman, a woman the disciples considered unclean, to show them what it really means to be clean. There are a couple of lessons to draw from this. The first is clearly that it's not enough to be pious and correct in the practice of our faith, in the externals only. They're important, but the real battleground is the heart, and the external practices are supposed to help us in its purification, not be a means to an end, not be an end in themselves, to make us look good and to feel morally superior. So that's the first point, that the heart is the important thing, mostly, and the externals are to support the purification of the heart, not be ends in themselves. The second is that we must be careful about how we see others, especially those who we, who we would consider outsiders, because unless our own hearts have been purified, we're not able to see or know the other rightly or truthfully. Recall that St. Mary of Egypt, who had lived a wild and debauched life, having spent years in the desert being purified, knew who St. Zosimus was and the conditions of the monastery he came from without ever having seen him. St. Zosimus himself had spent his life in asceticism and was able to see the holiness in St. Mary despite her outward appearance and the circumstances of her past. He could see past all those things. He could see how extraordinarily holy she had become. On the other hand, we have the example of St. Xenia of Petersburg who spent many years wandering the streets of St. Petersburg in her dead husband's military uniform, suffering scorn and abuse 
from people who are unable to see beyond their five senses and, and rightly see the holiness of her life. Only a pure heart can see rightly, and we can only have true knowledge of God, other people, and the world through a purified heart. Our five senses and our abilities for logical thinking are supposed to be instruments that support this higher way of knowing, the no way of knowing of the heart, which is the noose, the higher faculty of the soul, which can communicate with God, which receives things directly from God, experiences the world in a very intuitive, direct way. That's the faculty that should be supported by our five senses. But it's gone the other way around, particularly in the modern world, because we live in a very materialist culture, the philosophy is very materialist. Our five senses and what we can measure has come to dominate everything. And so what has happened, um, it's led to an extreme increase in observations and opinions about various aspects of people and things, but we remain largely ignorant of the whole because only a properly functioning heart can put all of those things together in their rightful place. Thankfully, the church gives us the tools that we need to restore the heart to its rightful place and have it purified. Our baptism and chrismation begins the process of healing the heart, and our life in the church continues it. Regular participation in the liturgy, receiving the Eucharist, confession, almsgiving, fasting, reading scripture, and regular personal prayer bring healing to the heart allowing it to be filled with the light of Christ. And it is in his light that we can see him and everything else rightly or truthfully. As we head towards Great Lent, may God give us the grace to focus on things that will bring us health and true knowledge in the hope of seeing Christ, other people and our world transfigured in his light. Amen. Rejoice.